In today's video, I interview my good friend, Dr. Sean McDowell, about a book he co-wrote called Set Adrift. It's about deconstruction, the trendiest movement that's happened to Christianity since Gnosticism. Dr. Sean McDowell has written a lot of books, and I have to say, this is actually one of my favorites that he has written. I ask a lot of key questions about deconstruction in this video, but it is a shorter video. If you want more information on this topic, I highly recommend that you check out other videos that I've done on this topic, as well as videos that Sean has done on his channel. I I also want to point out that not too long ago, I interviewed my good friend Elisa Childers and Tim Barnett about their book called The Deconstruction of Christianity. Sean also interviewed them on his channel. I wanted to tell you guys about this interview because what Sean and I discuss in this video is just about his book. We don't bring up uh, the differences between things that he might define in his book and things that might be different in Tim and Elisa's book. I highly recommend that you check out the video on his channel and his conversation with them. I will leave everything in the description of this video for you to check out. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. Hey everybody, I'm here with my very good friend, Dr. Sean McDowell, to talk about a topic that I am very interested in lately, and it's the topic of deconstruction. If you haven't noticed, there's uh, quite a movement going on uh, and quite a hot topic where a lot of Christians are talking about this right now uh, because it's kind of in our faces. This is something that I'm sure a lot of you watching have dealt with, what maybe personally, uh, maybe from afar, but it is something that you have heard of. I'm quite positive of it. Um, but first, Sean, I want to thank you so much for coming on my channel and talking with me about this today. Oh, Melissa, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's always fun. Specifically, it's about your book, um, Set Adrift. Um, very appropriate title considering what your book is about, which is mainly uh, kind of reaching out to the Christian who's in a process of deconstruction or maybe somebody that knows somebody who is deconstructing. Um, and so on that note, let's go ahead and jump right in to these questions I have for you. I find that this is a topic that the church really needs to know more about. And what I usually like to start with is defining what deconstruction even is. So let's start there. Can you define this for us? Yeah, one of the tricky things with defining deconstruction is there's a lot of people who use the word in a range of different ways. And I also think words change. Neil Shenvey and Pat Sawyer talk about this in their recent book, Critical Dilemma. They're like, even words like social mm -hmm. justice are on the move and they change as people use them differently. Broadly speaking, there's three things the word would refer to. One would be kind of a postmodern philosophy from Jacques Derrida that really started to become popular maybe in the 80s and 90s, which is a way of looking at a text and stripping it of authorial meaning and looking for kind of implications or thoughts or ideas embedded within it that are kind of behind it. You deconstruct the text, you tear it down. That's one term in postmodern philosophy. The vast majority of people who use this have not read <laughs> Derrida or even most postmodern philosophers. Another term we also mm -hmm. see very popularly used, especially on TikTok and, uh, and social media, is more of a negative critical term to those who've grown up in the Christian faith typically a more conservative, fundamentalist, even or evangelical household or church. And it's a way of stripping away their faith, so to speak. It's more of a negative destruct that has nothing positive about it. It's tearing down one's faith is a kind of deconstruction and encouraging others to do so. Quite a few people mm -hmm. actually use deconstruction in a different fashion, and this is the way we use it in the book, as a way of relooking at some beliefs that you have and asking, are they really biblical and are they really faithful to Jesus? So it involves a D, mm -hmm. which is tearing something down, but building back up a more biblically faithful foundation. Some add the adjective and refer to it as like reforming deconstruction. That's the way we tend to use it here in the book. So people like Michael Kruger will use it that way. Uh, some Christians use it differently. That's why one of the most important questions when somebody says, I'm deconstructing, or what do you think about deconstruction, is exactly what you asked me. What do you mean by deconstruction? Yeah, and it's pretty much the pinpointed question that I'm learning to ask in this regard. And it's so, it's so funny because as you mentioned his name, how do you, I see his name in print, 
but I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Jacques de Terra, you said? Uh, Jacques Derrida, French philosopher, postmodern Derrida. philosopher. Derrida, okay. yeah. <laughs> yes, he he always comes up. And it's it's as you mentioned him, I was writing his name down to remind you as a follow-up question on this, because um, the reason why I always start with this is because this seems to be like a postmodern term. And if people don't know what postmodernism is, uh, it's you know similar to relativism, and it seems to be constantly evolving, which, and it, what it reminds me of is, uh, you know when you get an eggshell stuck in a bowl after you've cracked it, and you're just trying to get it out, and it keeps <laughs> evading your finger, and it's really maddening. That's kind of what this reminds me of, is just that it's, it's hmm. constantly getting away from us, and so it's almost done on purpose, it seems. And I kind of wanted to pick your mind a little bit more about this. Um, if you don't mind, I actually wanted to read a little bit sure. of a part that I underlined that I found very helpful to understand this. And then I kind of wanted to get your uh, thoughts, your follow-up thoughts on this. But you're talking about him on this page and the motive for deconstructing knowledge claims. And mm -hmm. it really helps me understand uh, why this is something that's attached to progressive Christianity deconstruction and postmodernism. His motive in deconstructing knowledge claims arose from his concern over illegitimate appeals to authority and exercises of power. The belief that one has reached the single correct interpretation mm. of reality provides a great excuse for condemning those who disagree with it. And then you go on to say, um, if the official interpretation of a matter can be shown not to reflect reality, but to be only a social construction, then it loses its power to oppress. And then they become, what becomes truth is just the collective hunches of society. And how I took that, hmm. and let me know if you agree or disagree, is that if truth exists, objective truth in this regard, it excludes others, but that's wrong. We want to include everybody. And so I think that this is really a question of motives when it comes to hmm. deconstruction on why people would want to do that. Um, it's not really a question, but I'd love to kind of just get your thoughts on what I just said and kind of maybe uh, elaborate more on this point. I think it's very important. So Derrida has taken a literary approach to a text, and he's questioning that authority rests within the author who writes something. That's kind of what this mm -hmm. process is. He deconstructs it, and through certain tools and certain analyses – you kind of reveal that there's certain hidden assumptions and biases worked into a text. Now, there's some truth about this, that we have certain assumptions and biases mm -hmm. that we bring to a text. But when you take this so far and you remove the idea of an objective truth that we can know and that authority rests within a text, you're left with a kind of relativism, so to speak. And I think that's where a radical deconstruction ultimately leads towards the kind of relativism that you are pointing towards. So in a sense, in any philosophy, there's some truth or enough truth to get people's attention, to give them pause and find it appealing. Otherwise, nobody would believe it. So Derrida has pointed out certain abuses in text, abuses of authority, abuses of power, etc. But do we go so far as completely stripping a text of its authorial uh, intention and authority? That's where I would give pause. And ironically, even at times, I don't have it in front of me. This is in a different book. Even Derrida has complained that certain people have misrepresented him, which kind of only makes sense if he's an author with authority and is intending to convey a certain level of truth itself. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was actually about to ask that because it seems kind of self-defeating to say that, you know, he's saying, mm. oh, we need to, you know, take these with a grain of salt, but does that apply to his own writings? So yeah, no, thank you for elaborating on that. I thought that was just a really interesting part of the book that actually really stuck with me. Um, and speaking of which, I think throughout this whole book, you do a really good job, both of you, you and your co-author, uh, John Marriott. Yeah, you guys do a very good job, in my opinion, of being very fair. You're, you're presenting the progressive view, and then you simply explain why you disagree with it. And mm. what that helps me do is understand the progressive view and why they hold it. Now, one of the beliefs that a progressive holds is that we should see scripture through the lens of 
Jesus. And I'm wondering if you can tell my viewers what that means in the progressive view and why you disagree with it. So like the word deconstruction, even the term progressive or progressive Christian, there's a lot of difference in how people understand it and interpret and define that. So there are some people who would define themselves as progressive Christians that I would say are within orthodoxy, broadly speaking, on the person of Jesus, the nature of faith, etc. I don't have a problem with that. But there's quite a few who I think very clearly have left the resurrection of Jesus, the sinlessness of Christ, uh, the authority of scripture mm -hmm. behind. So when we talk about progressive Christianity, it, it's a, it just, it's another term. We almost need to talk about a particular progressive Christian rather than a movement that is so big and has such variety to it. Now, with that yeah. said, we do see certain tendencies amongst many progressive Christians. And you cited one of them that we often hear people say, which is to interpret everything through the person of Jesus. So that would be downplaying things like the Old Testament, downplaying like the person of Paul. That would be an approach of doing so. Uh, I think within progressive Christianity, many times you'll see other forms of authority stepping in. And what's interesting, it's not like conservatives more like you and I have an authority and progressive Christians don't, we all have some authority that we look to. The question is just which authority do we look to and why? Is it something within culture? Is it something within my feelings and myself? Is it Jesus? Is it the Bible? So when I'm in a conversation with anybody, however they define themselves, deconstructionist, their authority might be science, whatever it is. I want to know what that person's authority is. So for many progressive Christians, they will say, well, Jesus is my authority. Where I would push back is I would say, well, we need to look at how Jesus viewed the Old Testament and look at how Jesus viewed Scripture. And he seemed to hold yeah. the Old Testament as being historically true, being authoritative within itself. And so if you hold Jesus up as an authority, I'm not sure how we can start moving beyond some of the difficult, challenging passages of the Old Testament. But in principle, I would say, look, even Jesus says in Luke 24, when he's talking with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, he says, mm -hmm. you, you didn't realize that the Old Testament spoke of me. So all the scriptures are pointing towards Jesus from Genesis all the way to Revelation. That's a fact that conservative Christians we would hold on to. But I get nervous when people start saying, well, what we mean by Jesus being the authority is that Jesus is loving and then love is defined in a certain fashion that is more cultural than biblical. Now I say you're claiming that Jesus is the authority, but you're muzzling in a different view here that ends up, I think, holding a view of the scriptures that Jesus himself would not have held. That's where I would say time out and take issue with that move. Yeah. And this is actually a really fascinating question. This is very interesting. So I guess I would ask uh, a follow-up question if you would give the perspective. If I were to ask that somebody, a progressive Christian, and that's their position, like, okay, well, we see it through the lens of Jesus. And I, I would wonder, the first thing I would wonder is, well, what's informing your view of Jesus? How do you know who he is? How do you get your information of who Jesus is? I don't understand how they would have an e even a concept of who he is without the Bible. So how do they how do they grapple with that? I guess I, I would I would ask somebody that genuinely wondering what their position would be. So that's a totally fair question, and I hesitate to speak for or on behalf of progressive yeah, Christians. I'm <laughs> but I, I suspect some might make a move and say we can use the scriptures as a historical book. We can use it about the words of Jesus, but it doesn't mean we think it's all entirely inspired in the way conservative takes it. Doesn't mean we embrace inerrancy the way a conservative would take it. So we can still look at the teachings of Jesus, but we don't have to look at it through the lens of a conservative view of authority and a conservative view of inerrancy is a move I've seen some progressive Christians make. So therefore you can have some of the teachings of Jesus, maybe not other teachings of Jesus and other parts of scripture. Again, all progressive Christians don't make that move, but some do. Yeah, it seems uh, 
you know, it's kind of like maybe pick and choosy. I remember actually speaking with a progressive pastor. And one of the things that he said is that he sees scripture through the lens of love. So Mm. everything that he reads, if it's not loving, it's discarded. And so maybe it's something similar like that, but you're right. I think it depends on who you're talking to um, in that regard. Now, speaking of this, so uh, there's a whole chapter. This is probably my favorite chapter. It's about value systems. Hmm. I thought this was such an interesting chapter because it's it's like a, a snowball effect. It's just one one piece of information given after the, the other, and it really helps build those blocks to understand this point. Um, and what I thought particularly was fascinating was how the root of deconstruction, I might be oversimplifying this, and please feel free to elaborate um, sure. in this question, but uh, the root of deconstruction has to do with value systems. And everybody's going to have to get the book to kind of understand how that's broken down rather brilliantly, in my opinion. Um, but I'm, I am wondering if you can elaborate on that. What do you mean about uh, value systems playing a part in the deconstruction of a Christian? Yeah, this is really helpful. So my co-author, John Marriott, has, a I thought, an interesting illustration he uses where he's having a talk with a young Christian who asks him after talk his view on same-sex marriage. And John gives a standard biblical response that God has designed marriage, one man, one woman, you know, one flesh for one lifetime. And this this young man, young Christian, starts pushing back on uh, his biblical understanding. And so he goes to the scriptures and starts giving a biblical defense. And when it's all said and done, this young Christian goes, I can't really argue with your scripture, but it just doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> it doesn't feel right to yeah. me. And that term feel right to me is so interesting. And the way we flush it out in the chapter is we're trying to draw attention to something called a social imaginary. Now, it's very similar to worldview, but it's not exactly a a synonym for worldview. It kind of means certain values and certain assumptions that we take for granted that we maybe don't even realize that we hold. You might say they're the air we breathe or the water we swim in. And because of our culture and the way we communicate, these are things we take for granted underneath the surface, so to speak, that we don't call into question, we just assume them. And one of the things that's at the heart of our culture is things like, as you know, Melissa, you do you, you be you. Or I was speaking with my, I'm teaching a high school class still, and we're going through Thaddeus Williams, a colleague of mine at Biola. He has a book called Don't Follow Your Heart. And we literally were talking this morning with about 17 high school students about how one of the biggest so-called sins in our culture today is to not be authentic, meaning not being true to yourself, that the authority is your Mm -hmm. feelings. The authority is however you see the world. And it's sinful for people to not celebrate your chosen identity. Well, this is everywhere in social media. It's in our films. It's pushed and it's preached everywhere. So many people in the church who know what the Bible says have bought into this social imaginary that I just am supposed to express myself to the world. I'm supposed to be true to myself. And so that value runs up against a biblical value that says, actually, it's not about your feelings. It's not about you. It's about loving God and it's about loving others. In fact, what you mentioned, the pastor said earlier that I interpret Jesus through the lens of love. Well, I do too. But the question is, what do we mean by love? And our culture in many circumstances understands it as a feeling you have that involves affirming somebody else's chosen identity. Well, biblically speaking, love is willing the best for another. Your objective good is what it means to love and sacrifice for another. So in this chapter, we're just trying to help people understand when people go through a process of deconstruction, many times they don't realize the underlying value tension that's taking place with certain things in the culture that they've simply adopted as a part of the social imaginary and never pushed back and said, where do those values come from? Why do I define love that way? And then comparing that with the values of scripture. That's what we're trying to unpack in this book. And by the way, really all we're trying to do, you know, from reading this is this is not an apologetics book. 
We're actually not telling people Mm -hmm. what to believe. We're trying to walk them through a process of saying, okay, you're questioning your faith. You're deconstructing. Why? How did you get here? What questions do you ask and what could be at the root of it? And I think, like you said, deep down, this value tension is so often at the root of it. I think that's why I enjoyed it so much is that there was a completely different angle on that level. Mm. And it was just so interesting, you know, and uh, the first time I ever heard the term social imaginary was in Carl Truman's book, Strange New World. Such an amazing book that that really helped me understand certain things in the world, too. And the other thing that you guys do (laughs) a lot, and I, I don't know, you and I, I've noticed that you and I do this, we'll take things from like movies and kind of use it as examples to help people understand. And sure. you guys use the Anakin Skywalker reference. It was really geeky and awesome and, and good. And as you were talking, uh, what it reminded me of was Thanos, you know, and, and Endgame, mm. you know, about the, the greater good. Spoiler alert, but, you know, Tony Stark, you know, he dies at the end for everybody else. <laughs> and it's just, that's kind of what it's about. And I think that's why in our heart of hearts, we love movies like that. We love the person who sacrifices themselves for the good mm. of others. He didn't do what made him happy, you know? And I think that there's a deeper uh, gospel message in those kinds of things. So, um, you know, and I have a piggyback question on this. So as you're talking about the social imaginary, about things that we as Christians or people as a society accept as just, you know, things that are true because that's what our culture says. Another word that comes up is social construct. This is a big buzzword in these groups because what it comes to deconstruction, basically a lot of the times that they're trying to do is they're trying to break down what they perceive as a social construct. This is not authentic. And I'm wondering first, if you can define what a social construct is, uh, but secondly, how does that play a part in deconstruction? And when is it not a social construct? In other words, when do you fall into the face of reality? When does that When can you know when it's not a social construct? This is a great question. I don't know if I can give you a formal or great definition of social construct. I don't remember defining it in the book. Maybe I'm losing my my mind, but I think I can tell you the way it's just typically used is that it's an invention. It's not something that's real that exists in a mind-independent fashion, but it's something that we've just kind of made up and probably in some fashion, believe that it's true and real, even though it's just imaginary. That's probably what's meant by a social construct. So depending on how we define deconstruction, if you mean it by the second way that I described it, a critical tearing down, then many of people who are pushing that kind of deconstruction really think the entire evangelical Christian system is a social construct. Jesus is not the only way to get to God. The historical resurrection itself is, you know, it could be true. It could not be true. It's not necessary. Uh, The Bible doesn't have authority built into itself. Uh, the, The idea of the atonement and the virgin birth, these are constructs that we've invented. And so if they're right and those are not really real and we've invented them, then they should, in a sense, be torn down. Again, if they're not real. What we walk Mm -hmm. through in the book is we try to help Christians who have not abandoned Jesus, who haven't abandoned the scriptures, but find themselves questioning some of the things that maybe they've received in the culture or in the church and are saying, I want a more biblically rooted and just Jesus focused faith. Are there certain Mm -hmm. social constructs or things that I've just accepted as if they're true, that don't line up with scripture, well, that's also something that should be torn down, so to speak, but replaced with a more biblical view of what that is. Now, that's my understanding. Is that what you meant by social construct? Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, you know, the, the, I remember the exact example you guys used in the book was uh, like blue for boys, pink for girls. Oh, okay. Uh, Describing, you know, yeah, like basically something that society has made to help us function. And these are things that we, I remember taking for granted in grade school, you know, just school, (laughs) you know, like how we do school. It's like a social construct, but it's not bad. 
You know, it's not like this terrible thing. There's certain things that we do that help us function as a society, but there's certain things that they're claiming um, are social constructs that are not grounded in truth. And then this is the whole most ironic thing about it all is that, again, truth isn't really their end goal. Um, it's what you feel inside. It's what makes you authentic. And so, for example, they'll say gender is a social construct. You know, that's just something that society created um, and gender roles, society created that. That's not really true. You need to go with how you feel. And so it, that was like the general example you guys used. What do you think mm -hmm. is the best advice that you would give to somebody that is going through this mess? They're kind of trying to figure it out. They're trying to, you know, know what to believe. I love that question. As far as social construct, I re recall that now. And I would agree that pink being feminine and blue being masculine is a social construct. That's something we've invented and we've made up and we've associated with gender, but is really just something yeah. that is rooted within society and within culture. What our culture is increasingly saying is the idea of gender and even differences in biological sex itself is a social construct. That's where I would say time out. I am not on board with that for a range of reasons. So there's no problem in saying certain things are social construct and should be mm -hmm. deconstructed in a sense. But when you go so far as starting to deconstruct the differences between boys and girls, then you've gone too far, yeah. I think, scientifically and biblically. Now, my advice for somebody who is going through a process of questioning is a, a few mm -hmm. things I would say. Number one, don't bury it down inside. To just say, this is going to go away, I'll deal with it later. Many ways, doubts and questions can fester like a cancer, like a spiritual cancer. So I, ha I went through a real period of questioning in my life, in college, interestingly enough. And one of the best things I did is when I told my dad, and then I had somebody else who kind of mentored me and acted, it really... In many ways, to be honest with you, this is the book that I wrote that I wish I could have given to myself about 30 years ago when I started going through this questioning process. It's not an apologetics book. I'm not trying to answer certain questions, but I had a mentor in my life. His name was and still is Rob Lone, and I would ask him questions. He would guide me spiritually. He would kind of walk me through the way we walked through in this book without pressure so I could just kind of think through, why do I believe what I believe? Where do those beliefs come from? Mm -hmm. What does scripture say about this? And so number one, don't bury it down aside. Number two, share with somebody you know and you trust to kind of get it off your chest, so to speak, and then just start processing this. The third thing I would say is if you're going through a period of deconstruction, it's really important who you surround yourself with. So there's a lot of people who talk about reforming deconstruction in a positive way. And then there's a lot of people who have a more negative deconstruction. This is where I love you know, Tim Barnett and Elisa Chiller's book where they say there's a whole community of people who call themselves deconstructionists who are intent upon tearing down your faith. I would just simply ask somebody, mm -hmm. is that the best community to surround yourself with if you have questions? and you're trying to work through something honestly, is that the best community? I'm actually not even telling you yes or no, even though I have serious opinions about that. I'm simply saying this is a question to ask, who do you surround yourself with? Because the voices that speak into you are going to radically, radically shape your life. And do you want a negative, critical voice at this moment? Uh, I think that's a fair question. So Bottom line, express it to somebody, someone you can trust, be wise who you put around you. And I think the last thing I would say is you're not alone. Uh, there's a whole lot of people who have gone through periods of questioning their faith, myself included. Mm -hmm. It might feel pretty lonely and it might feel pretty painful. I get that. It was for me in many ways, but it's not permanent and you're not alone. And I think there's a way through it. If you're willing to really trust God through this, ask the right questions and and seek after what scripture says. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for coming on, guys. Set Adrift. I will leave a link in the description, uh, which follow up question on that. Where can people get the book and where can people find you? 
Uh, gosh, people could probably get the book at any bookseller online that they prefer. I link to it on on my website. So to Barnes and Nobles, ChristianBook.com, Amazon.com, all of those have it. So just go find the one that's cheapest and quickest for you. Uh, for me, <laughs> I'm all over the place in social media. My website is probably the quickest place to link to Twitter, Instagram, my TikTok, YouTube channel, books, speaking, et cetera. That's probably the one hub that would link to different different places. But like you, I'm all over YouTube as well. Yeah, you're all over the place. You're very active on social media. So I'm, I'm positive you guys will see Sean pop up in your algorithm at some point. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and speaking with me, everybody. Uh, everything that we talked about that I think is relevant to this conversation will be in the description of this video for you to check out. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And Sean, thank you so much for coming on. Great questions. Happy to do it.